Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Greetings. Uh, I'm Robert Lee Kilpatrick, the chair of the Health and Medicine Member-Led Forum here at the Commonwealth Club, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. You know, 15 months ago, when COVID-19 started, uh, a club that for 117 years had only had in-person programs uh, went into a digital platform. And thanks to our excellent tech team, we've been able to have programs like this one today. I'm really delighted to uh, introduce uh, part of our Healthy Society series, a uh, program titled Nobody's Normal, uh, the History, Culture, Stigma, and Future of Mental Health. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, uh, Janara Nuremberg, who's the author of Divergent Minds. She's a journalist and covers books at UC Berkeley, and she's the founder of the Neurodiversity Project. And she'll be in conversation with uh, Professor Richard Grinker, who is Professor of Anthropology at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He's the editor-in-chief of Anthropological Quarterly and author of the book that we're going to hear about today, Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. So welcome. Uh, don't uh, hesitate to post questions if you have any, and we'll do our best to field them. Uh, Baton, over to you, Janara. Welcome. Thank you so much, Robbie. It's great to be back here at the Commonwealth Club. And I'm so excited. Richard, um, I love your book. Um, as Robbie mentioned, I'm a journalist. I'm the author of Divergent Mind. And um, the topic of, you know, nobody's normal is very personal to me. Um, like yourself, I grew up in a family of therapists and psychologists. And so that theme has always been present for me. And um, I know we've chatted before. Everyone should definitely check out the book, Nobody's Normal. And so I'm so excited to dive in with you um, again. So let's start. Um, just what was the genesis and the catalyst uh, for this book? Well, I was always interested in uh, the obstacles to mental health care. Um, I grew up in a family of therapists who always complained that people didn't come to get therapy enough, that there was a higher prevalence of mental illnesses in the general population. And you know, a lot of really devoted scholars and clinicians have spent a whole lot of time over the past many decades trying to figure out what those obstacles were. And they generally come down uh, to uh, a bottom line, which is that stigma appears to be uh, always uh, a, an impediment. And so how do we reduce stigma is the, you know, the, the major question we need to ask. And what we have discovered is that all the education campaigns and all the awareness campaigns, they don't necessarily make a dent in stigma because stigma is not the result of ignorance or lack of education. It is the result of the kind of person that we value. And so wherever our ideals are, whatever we consider to be the good human being, that's the measure against which we stigmatize people who diverge. In other words, stigma and any concept of the abnormal are really variants of what we consider to be good and not good. And I wanted to bring both my personal and a cross-cultural perspective to this to see if we can look critically at our society and understand why it is we've stigmatized mental illnesses and what we can do to minimize it. That's fantastic. Yeah, I love that you have such a global international focus, um, which makes sense. You're an anthropologist. And I'm particularly intrigued by the discussion around capitalism, which I know we've talked about before. Can you introduce, introduce us to that um, element of the book, like how capitalism has um, influenced and informed our notion of what's normal and what's not normal? Well, let me answer your question by prefacing it first with a, 
uh, a statement that often people say, wait, why is this anthropologist talking about industrialism and capitalism? Shouldn't he be out in the villages of, of Central Africa or something? Well, the reality is that anthropology is just partly about going to other cultures. It is also about going away in order to come back that if we shift our perspective, then we get detached for a moment, we can come back and see our world in a new light. Like when you go to France and you see the roads are so narrow and it strikes you and then you come back and all of a sudden it strikes you that the roads are so wide in the US. And so when we look at our own society, we often do so in a more critical and better light when we've been away, when we've looked outside and even history is itself like a, another culture. And what we find in capitalism, in the history of capitalism, is not that capitalism created the stigma of mental illness, but that capitalism created the conditions under which mental illnesses could be stigmatized. And what I mean by that is it created the conditions in which we could marginalize, shame, discriminate against people who did not conform to those new ideals dictated by capitalism, the autonomous, independent individual who is a producer, maximizing production. And if you couldn't work for whatever reason, whether it was a mental illness or a physical disability, you were marginalized. And so that's what capitalism did. It imposed this new kind of ideal human being on us. And what we're discovering now, and I write about this in Nobody's Normal in a very optimistic tone, is that we are reevaluating what we consider to be the good human being, or even the good worker, or the good mind. And as we reevaluate those things, we are seeing uh, that stigma is decreasing. Right. And can you can you walk us through some personal examples? I know we've chatted about this before um, in your own life. Um, you, you're also the author of Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism. And you've written openly about um, your daughter's experience. And, um, you know, what has that meant for you personally to kind of take a step back away from this sort of dominant capitalist mindset and say like, hmm, what is the value of, you know, absolute independence and absolute independent selfhood and this emphasis on individuality? And how has that influenced your own decision making and your own family, your own perspective as a parent? Well, I can tell you that as a parent of a child with autism, now a 29 year old with autism, I'm all often asked, I've been asked for, for you know, two decades, when will, when will your child be able to live independently? And I have reevaluated that. I said, well, why should she live independently? You know, if she was on her own, she'd be isolated. She, she wouldn't have all of the supports we have. Um, to be dependent is actually to be human. We all depend on other people. This notion that we can all be completely autonomous, independent individuals is, you know, an illusion, right? And so throughout her life, she was born in 1991, just as autism was becoming a more popular term, in these last 28, 29 years, we've seen a dramatic change. You go back two decades ago, I'd try to have her go to an art class or a ballet class or a summer camp. Oh, she can't do that. She has autism. You don't want to set her up to fail. What's happened over the past 20 years is that we have realized that we exist on a spectrum and that people with autism and any host of other uh, neurodevelopmental variants are actually capable of doing a whole lot of stuff if we find ways for them to fit into society. I tell the story of a little boy in Namibia who is the best person in his village at finding lost things and the best person in his village at herding the goats, but he's nonverbal. He has what would almost certainly be diagnosed as an intellectual disability in the United States. And yet they have found an affordance, an accommodation, a place for him. And we are starting to do that as well. When Elon Musk went on to Saturday Night Live and said, I'm the first person with Asperger's to be in there. Well, you go back three decades, he would have been rejected from any job interview because he has a physical tick, because he talks only about himself, because he has social challenges. And we're now, we're now you know, sort of reevaluating how we look at human beings. And part of that also is, is allowing people with autism to take risks. You know, one of the things about capitalism is we always encourage people to take risks, but we shelter people who have disabilities. We say, oh no, you can't, we don't want you to fail. But that's dehumanizing. 
the dignity that we give a human being is to allow them to find ways to construct a meaningful life. And so my mantra going through my daughter's childhood is let's set her up to see if she can meet the challenge. And if she fails, well, then we've given her that opportunity. And, you know, most of the time she actually surprises us and doesn't fail. And can you talk about, um, you know, because your book focuses on, you know, several different countries, settings, contexts, um, different researchers, different types of, um, you know, on the ground, in the field, practitioners, community mental health practitioners. Do you think there's um, maybe a difference between different uh, forms of neurodivergence, like how um, schizophrenia is received compared to autism, compared to bipolar? Did you see that kind of difference in your research or do you see it more as like um, kind of an umbrella around like how the society or culture thinks about difference period. Well, what I can say is that every society has its own way of viewing various forms of human difference. And they construct it. They make it out of their history, out of their culture. And I consider that to be a very empowering fact. Because if it is culture and not nature that shapes the way we view bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, or any of those symptoms not named, but described, then we have the power to change it. We have the power to change the world. I mean, in Japan, just changing the word for schizophrenia away from a word that meant a mind torn asunder to one that meant a mind that is um, in search of coherence Mm -hmm. um, changed the number of people who were actually willing to get care and just a name. Sometimes little things can have huge consequences, but it wasn't biology. Those people are the same people, right? It was culture that changed it. A group of people who are advocates who said, let's change the name. That's how it happened. That's really powerful. I'm I'm actually getting chills from that, you know, just to, you know, to feel um, how powerful that uh, transition is, just changing a few words, changing the frame. Um, so yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. Now we're getting Asperger's. Questions. But you know, Asperger's is, is one of those words that was really important at a time. Right. Right. Yeah. We needed a people really wanted a word that at a time when autism signified a devastating, uh, a universally devastating condition uh, and didn't reflect a broad spectrum. We needed a word that could say, yes, they're autistic, but they're verbal or they are perhaps able to go to you know, high school or college. Um, and now that we have destigmatized autism so much and expanded its, the notion of it to a spectrum, we don't need Asperger's anymore. And in 2013, it was removed from the DSM. Now, people still use it, you know, as a folk category, but we don't really need it anymore because our society changed. Yeah, I know. And then there's other controversies around that verbiage. So <laughs> it kind of like is, it gets a little political at times, too. Um, we're getting a question here. Um, where does the concept of normality originate? And when was the word first used? I don't know. D- does your book look yeah. at the actual first use of that? OK, um, well, I, I, I cannot recall whether I have its actual first usage, um, but the word was mathematical. It meant mm-hmm. average. It was a mathematical term, and and we developed in the United States in the 19th century so-called normal schools, and normal schools were designed as teacher training colleges to train teachers to treat the to teach the the the, the norms of American society to teachers. Um, but it is only uh, post World War II, actually, um, after the Kinsey report, that mm-hmm. it becomes something to aspire to not just average or even mediocre, but the thing that you wanted to be in what David Reisman called the age of conformity, to be like everybody else. And so that's when we really see normal uh, start to emerge. And my grandfather, and I write about this at length in the book, was highly critical of the concept of normality because he saw it as assimilationist and conformist and and so on. And, And he thought that the costs of aspiring to normality were a, were, were a loss of creativity and innovation. 
Yeah. Um, so how, I mean, where would you say we are now? I mean, I know um, you and I have talked before, um, you know, we have colleagues like uh, Steve Silberman, Ellen Sachs at USC, um, 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 the professor who focuses on bipolar um, at Johns Hopkins, Kay, um, forgetting her full name, but you know, there's like, Yes, there's several of us who are kind of documenting these movements, these shifts within psychiatry, within society. Um, sometimes I feel like as a researcher and a journalist, like we're, you know, we're in a tiny bubble, like even though that's our whole world and our own perspectives have shifted so much. Um, still, if you go out into workplaces, um, individual homes, schools, uh, pop culture, media, film. Um, there's just such a huge gap there. And I'm so excited that um, the work that we're doing is helping to kind of change minds and reduce stigma. Um, but I don't know, I wonder what your thoughts are on that gap, um, how we can continue to kind of like push and agitate and how we'll ultimately really get over that hill of like banishing stigma. You know, it's it's the the um, strategy. And oh, just to correct myself, I said Emily Martin, who was one of the authors who wrote on bipolar disorder, who was at Johns Hopkins. Oh. I think you were referring to Kay Redfield Jameson, another yes. Johns Hopkins University professor who wrote about her bipolar disorder. But both did. Um, but you know, I think it's a it's a multi pronged um, strategy. You know, you have to you you can't achieve anything um, unless uh, you have consensus and you have buy in. Right. And I think it is has been folly for us to expect that employers and schools uh, were going to be the ones that were going to somehow uh, rescue people with disabilities and uh, uh, neurodivergent minds and somehow you know, make them uh, 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 more uh, capable of integrating with their communities. What has happened is that people who are neurodivergent, people who do have disabilities, who do have mental illnesses, they have taken the reins and said, you know what, you don't have to save me. I I'm gonna define myself by myself and I'm not gonna define myself as you want me to be defined. And this is something that we're seeing across the board uh, where concepts that used to discriminate are now being reclaimed by the people who were discriminated against. So the word cripple, well, we now have crip studies the word queer, we now have queer studies. Fat, we now have fat studies. Um, neurodiversity, these are all ways in which people, and LGBTQ and trans movements as well, you know, where people are really saying, uh, I'm gonna go out and I'm going to advocate for myself and I'm going to represent myself. This is sort of reflected in the often used phrase, nothing about us without us, right? Uh, but the point is once people come out and they take ownership, and they define themselves, usually, you know, more often than you think, other people will actually step up. And yeah, I think, yeah, that's a good reminder. I mean, um, I know I went through that in, in my own journey and just like speaking openly um, about, you know, my own stuff, but there's, there's still that disconnect. So I, I think you're right that um, it requires those of us who are neurodivergent to step forward, speak openly, write openly, um, and that it, it really just takes time. I mean, it feels like taking a hammer and just like chipping away. And many of us band together. There's a lot of solidarity. And then there's even solidarity um, amongst other marginalized groups. And so, yeah, that's how we build movement. I guess personally, I'm I'm a little impatient. <laughs> like, I think, you know, I mean, I like yourself, I've written a lot about um, all the amazing changes. Um, and I guess like one area of concern I have is around workplaces. And because I think, um, and I don't know how you feel as a parent of a, of a grown daughter, um, but workplaces represent so much about like human agency, right? Like the ability to earn an income and like help provide for yourself or your family. And if workplaces stay um, these kind of um, symbols of neurotypicality or symbols of capitalism, and they kind of guard those kind of norms, and it's difficult for workplaces to let neurodivergent people into, 
um, that kind of chasm, I think, is going to stay there. So I don't know. Do, how? Do, what are your thoughts on that, either personally or professionally, in terms of what you found in your research? Well, I had a lot of um, I have a lot of positive, optimistic feelings about that, and I write in Nobody's Normal about some of the programs that big companies uh, like J.P. Morgan Chase have have launched uh, to hire people uh, with autism, and one of the really uh, great things about these hiring programs, whether it's at SAP, Walgreens, um, Ford Motor Company, J.P. Morgan Chase. I write a lot about a cybersecurity company. It's an offshoot of Hewlett Packard called DXC. Um, what is remarkable about these places is that when you interview the managers, they start to talk about things other than autism. So there were autism hiring programs, but it was like a, a tide that raised all boats. Yeah. So. All of a sudden, they're finding that people are being more open about depression or menopause or anything that is making somebody feel that they may not be, you know, um, uh, experiencing things that the, the way in which they want to. And, and this cybersecurity uh, manager, um, uh, Andrew Fieldhouse in Australia, he said to me that, that not long ago, a woman came to him and said, you know, I just don't feel myself. I'm going through menopausal changes and I'm, I'm not feeling myself and le let me know if my work is suffering. And he's, he stood back from that and he said, wow, I think this is because of our autism program. Hmm. Because now people feel more comfortable talking about all of the challenges that all human beings face. And here is a woman identifying herself in a male run pretty much company as a woman and an aging woman at that, right? Mm -hmm. Going through something which is just normal developmental, you know, human development, yeah. but which used to be kept so secret. You know, how did that happen? And so I do think that wherever we are putting our efforts, whether it's in autism, bipolar advocacy, whatever it might be, ADHD, that that is a tie that can potentially raise all boats. Yes, totally. I agree with that. That's that's exciting. Um, so we're getting more questions. Um, so someone's asking, how has the concept of normality become embedded in the identity politics of our day? Many people now feel the need to conform to identity norms organized around, for example, faith, gender, race or culture. Um, I don't know. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a, that's a very um, good question. It's a really difficult one to answer because every society everywhere in the world has types and classifications and names and professions and kinship roles and so on. And so it is essential that we conform to something. Or, I mean, if we, we don't conform to something, then we can't, I mean, if I saw you on the street and I, I could only say, how is the large formless blob today? And you could answer it's large and has no form. Uh, we have to say that we have to know that something is a chair, that something is a man or a woman or not that, or that somebody um, is a child or an adult. And we, we have to do that. And the question is, when we do this with, um, mental illnesses, disabilities, neurodevelopmental disorders, are we creating new kinds of people? The homosexual, the disabled, the, the trans person. And, and are we creating a kind of person that uh, is uh, stigmatized or are we creating a kind of person that is not? And so that is the key. We will always have types and identities and we have names for things. That is is inescapable. Uh, the question is, what, how do we value those? And so the person who is trans today, going maybe, th maybe through gender affirming surgeries, whatever that might be, um, that person may be valued now differently than they were before. But in a sense, they're the same person, but they have a new identity uh, and, and one that we now value differently. And we can see this, you know, across the board with uh, take the nerd or the geek, right? That has new meanings, doesn't it? But we still have that concept. That's really helpful, actually, because I definitely chew on this theme a lot of, um, I mean, it's kind of dialectical, right? Like you have, you have like these categories of one era, one generation, you know, and then like kind of a whole new crop 
comes up in reaction to the previous one. And then it kind of just keeps going. Um, do you think the ultimate goal is to is for none of these things to even matter? And then we don't even talk about it. No, I, I mean, I think that's it's unrealistic. We will always value and devalue things. And every society will find a way to stigmatize something. So being a good person um, and being somebody who is um, caring and loving about people who are struggling is always going to be an ongoing process because time won't stand still. You know, it'll, it'll keep changing. And the question is whether or not uh, we can change the way in which we view things. And I, I end the book with the Scarlet Letter and it's probably an unusual thing for people to encounter when they're reading a book about mental illness. Uh, but we all know, most of us know the Scarlet Letter, the 1850 book by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And at the end of this book, Hester Prynne, who's been forced to wear this um, embroidered letter A on her blouse for adultery, uh, comes back to the village and everybody says, it's been like 20 years. Why are you still wearing this? Take it off. You don't need to wear that anymore. Even the harshest judge says, you don't need to wear that anymore. And she goes, oh, no, it has ceased to be a stigma. It is now a sign of my endurance and my ability and my perseverance and my resilience to handle trauma and difficulty. She doesn't use the word trauma, but she uses the word stigma in Hawthorne's uh, book. And, um, and so over time, then, people start to see her as a source of inspiration. She's not damaged. She is now a source of strength and somebody that then people go to for counsel. They want her advice. This person that they had exiled, they now go to for advice. You can see how these things will change. And when we have new frameworks to understand, that's when we see stigma diminish. And I'll tell you a quick story. My daughter gave a high school graduation speech when she graduated in 2010 or whenever it was. And she started to give her speech. She was the first kid with a disability ever to be asked to give a speech for this high school. And when she started, she spoke in her unusual rhythm, her sing-song voice, and people whispered. And they murmured in the crowd. You could hear these murmurs. Those are the sounds of stigma. And they, she was weird to them. And then when she said, a person with autism like me, all of a sudden, the place quieted down because now they had a framework and one that we had destigmatized to understand her. She was no longer weird, enigmatic, or bizarre. She was now someone with autism. Oh, I get it. And she got a standing ovation, not because perhaps it was that great a speech, but because she took ownership. She, and she basically capitalized on their changing views of autism that we as a society had produced. I don't mean to be a Pollyanna. There's so much work to do, but I think we're on the right course. And the goal of Nobody's Normal is to say, how do we stay that course? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, we're, the tide is shifting. Uh, we're getting another question. So Dr. Grinker, do you think your and your other current work in some ways redeems the work of Thomas uh, Zass? I, I know this research, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, yes. um, from the 1960s and 70s. Um, I think that the value of Thomas Saz's work was that he, he pointed out from his own disciplinary perspective that how we conceive of mental illnesses is our construction. It's something that we, we make, right? So when you, see, you say someone has schizophrenia, they don't really have a, some virus or bacterium that you can find that says that is schizophrenia, but that they, we have created a concept that helps to frame um, the set of features that are common in a number of people. Um, and to group those symptoms in a constellation that we can then can give a name to. But we may not have that name in 50 years. We may not have that name in 100 years. There will still be people with psychoses, but we may talk about it in a different way. Um, in the same way, Saz points out that mental illnesses are constructions. So. The quest, the, the where I differ with Saz is that Saz really saw the whole notion of a mental illness as a myth. And I think that what's truly important is to understand that 
mental illness diagnoses can have extraordinary value because without a diagnosis, we don't have a way to drive a form of intervention or care or treatment. You can't get a treatment for cancer unless you have a diagnosis of cancer. And in the same way, we need to have treatments for mental illnesses. People, we shouldn't say that somebody who hears horrible voices in their head telling them they're horrible people um, and they should hate themselves is, is, is just another variant of humanity. They deserve to have care. The question is, how do we understand that on a spectrum so that we know when we go from point A to point B, where there is just a, a different way of thinking and being to something which really needs care? We saw in the history of homosexuality, right? Uh, homosexuality was called a mental illness. Mm -hmm. Now that was indeed a myth, but it is also true that homosexuality doesn't immunize anyone from depression or anxiety or other sorts of things, including social discrimination that can make them suffer emotionally. And so if somebody gets care, it doesn't mean that they're a bad person, but that they are suffering. And that's really what mental illness is about. It's where sadness becomes depression, where anxiety becomes debilitating, where shyness becomes autism, and where we say, enough, actually, you deserve care. Yeah, I think um, this is a very interesting um debate. And I wrote about it um, in my book as well. And it comes up all the time in these kind of conversations and events. I think um, I always feel like it's important for people to make choices that make sense for them. You know, I don't think that we as researchers and writers are advocating like any one certain way. You know, I think for some people having the information, understanding a potential diagnosis is very helpful and just having a framework. And then I think for other people, having the diagnosis is so critical, you know, and going that more like medicalized route because either to get medication, to advocate for um, accommodations at school or at work. And I think, um, I think that's the direction we wanna go in. And with a slogan like nobody's normal, we wanna empower people to have that sense of choice, right? To do what makes sense for them. You know, if they do want to seek out medication I, and treatment. I think that's a really important point to make when it comes to adults with autism, because you can say, what's the value of a diagnosis in an adult with autism? I mean, you can see the value of it for a six-year-old, drives a special education classroom, a better, better educational environment, whatever, maybe government services but you know, a 40 year old, a 50 year old. But what you're finding now is that lots of people are actually embracing an autism diagnosis at age 40 or 50 or 60 because it helps them make sense of themselves. They say, oh, now I understand why I've always felt this way, why it's harder for me to do X or Y, or why, or, or why I'm so skilled at this, but I'm so not skilled at this other thing. And so it can have benefits beyond actual medical and clinical care and yeah. be able to make sense of yourself if it's in a non-stigmatized framework. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. We're getting some more, someone is just sharing, um, oh, just that they're loving this perspective around stigma in society and they're um, thanking, thanking both of us. Um, thank you everyone who is watching and listening. Um, so um, are there any examples you would like to share from specific countries that you looked at, like something that you think, for example, we might want to implement here in the United States? Yeah, um, one of the things that really interested me was the work that is being done by some um, researchers and non-governmental organizations in Nepal, where you, know, you don't have a robust clinical, psychiatric, psychological community where the people who are suffering emotionally are not seeing a psychiatrist, they're seeing a general practitioner, right? And the general practitioners really are scared of people with mental illnesses. And so what a lot of these NGOs have done is they've, they've implemented programs to have people who have mental illnesses or who have uh, done well in some treatment, particularly PTSD, uh, to meet with primary care physicians in their training. And they find that when you have proximity 
And when you expose people to stories and narratives and have them meet people, that we see a real reduction in stigma. Now, we come back to the United States and we can say, maybe we should do the same thing with primary care physicians. I mean, there are lots of people who go to medical school and have almost no psychiatric training, you know, really, really minimal. Um, Secondly, we can um, understand why perhaps uh, certain kinds of media platforms like TikTok are actually having positive outcomes for people to um, reduce their shame and secrecy around uh, their various forms of suffering, where, you know, people have these, the ability to, to go onto mental illness channels on, on, say, TikTok and to see other people and to know you're not alone, to know that you are part of a broader community. Um, I think that we can learn a lot about the notion of proximity and how important that is. When I was growing up, I didn't see kids with disabilities, for example. Where were they? They were in residential institutions. So I didn't interact with them. But today, kids growing up know other kids who have disabilities. And over time, I know we're impatient. (laughs) We said, you already said that. But, you know, over time, I think that is going to have a really big impact. Uh, Instead of hiding people away, we say, no, this is this is humanity. This is this is who we are. And we also understand that people are only disabled when society makes them so. Like when we don't have elevators or ramps. That's the only way a person who's differently mobile and uses a wheelchair is disabled. If they have ramps and elevators, they're not disabled. Um, so if, we, if everybody spoke sign language the way they did in 19th century Martha's Vineyard, nobody would be deaf because everybody would speak sign language. So I think that, you know, there's just, there's a, there's a lot to learn. And I, I'm a big fan of, of proximity and openness and mainstreaming. Yeah, me too. I love that. Um, and I'm just, you know, laughing because this is another thing we share in common that I lived in Nepal for six years. And so, <laughs> um, you know, I was so struck when I opened your book and saw an entire chapter about Nepal. And I think even um, for my own journey, actually, when I was tr- trying to really synthesize um some of the scientific research with like anecdotal personal experiences and what I had seen in people around me um, separate from Nepal. Um, I had read this, you know, really fascinating article. This is maybe six years ago about uh, was, the title was what a shaman sees in a mental hospital, you know, and it was this really, um, really important look at, you know, someone who from, um, you know, what we'd say, like a developing country who's experiencing kind of like visions or something and how they were actually revered in their country of origin, their village of origin, um, not stigmatized. They were seen as almost having powers or something. Um, But then when you would kind of transplant like someone from that setting to a setting like the United States where everything is overly medicalized, um, you know, that person would be called crazy or disturbed and they would be, you know, outcasts and things like that. One concern I think I have is that, you know, in Nepal, for example, or um, several countries in Southern Africa, parts of South America, is that I think traditionally you do have strong shamanistic cultures, right? Um, But that because of the wave of Western medicine that has kind of had to go silent, kind of dormant. And so the stigma in a sense was something that we also exported, not entirely. I think there was native stigma as well, but I think that Western society really kind of increased it, right? So what I'm wondering the future of mental health is, you know, is the future some kind of, synthesis, because I don't think that what Western medicine has done is the total answer. And I don't think that, you know, just um, not having any Western science is the answer either. Um, But I do think that's an important conversation to have. And I'm not sure what you think about that, that kind of synthesis of the two. Well, I I totally agree with you that a lot of what was exported during the colonial era in in India and sub-Saharan Africa, elsewhere, was the idea that uh, illnesses are rooted not in society, but in the individual. 
They are the, they are caused by individuals having problems, not by the society. And where shamans ha- and and um, other spiritual healers have really excelled is in finding uh, the social causes for distress, and then. Um, acting on those social causes rather than seeing the individual as somehow at fault. Um, I think that when you talk about a synthesis, what we're really going to need is a synthesis between looking at the social origins of distress and the biological ones. And that's not gonna, that's not an easy one to to get to because, you know, we as human beings like to, we're really seduced by the simplistic, right? We love explanations which would say, oh, this is a totally biological disorder, or this is a totally, you know, spiritual or psychiatric disorder, the body, the mind, whatever it might be. The reality is those increasingly don't make sense. First of all, we know that the more people see mental illnesses as completely biological, the more that they are, they are feared. And it has, the, the turn to the brain has not destigmatized mental illnesses. Mm-hmm. Secondly, we know that there is a real biological component and a genetic component to mental illnesses, but that doesn't tell us the environmental effects, including traumatic childhood circumstances, or whether you were in a famine or in a war zone or whatever it might have been. We also now have epigenetic research that really flies in the face of any kind of body and mind distinction. What the epigenetic research has been showing is that um, if you uh, have grown up in a adverse circumstance, maybe you went through a war or a genocide, you can actually transmit predispositions toward emotional distress to your children. Now, we learned in school that Lamarck was wrong and Darwin was right, that Lamarck's idea that you could acquire characteristics in your life and then pass those on to your offspring made no sense. I can't lose my finger in an accident in a factory and then have a child and that child is born with that finger missing, right? But epigenetics is about the regulation of genes. It's about the enhancers. And those are things that are transmitted, we're finding now. So if you see that somebody has a very biological mental illness, but it is has an epigenetic component to it based on who their parents were or grandparents, can we really say that it is true, the mental illness is truly biological or truly environmental, social? We can't, it makes no sense because they interact together. So that's the kind of synthesis that we need to understand. But this is something, and I'm sorry for going on so long, but I'm just, I get kind of exercised about it. This is just one of the things that I really, find lacking in a lot of medical education. So they'll think, oh, this is a breast cancer tumor. It is a biological thing. I can see it in a microscope. And then we know that what culture that person lives in will shape the kind of treatment she gets, whether she sees a shaman, whether she sees a psychiatrist, whether she gets chemotherapy, whether she gets a mastectomy. We know that it will change her work life, her home life, maybe her married life. If she lives in a society that, that associates the breast with femininity and she has a mastectomy, will she now see herself as less of a woman? And that stuff's not visible in a microscope, right? That's the social stuff. That's the social stuff that tells us that no illness is entirely biological, that it is always the combination of the illness we have and the culture in which we live. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um... Yeah, I do hope that researchers take this up more. I mean, epigenetics is beginning to be looked at, which I think is really exciting. Um, You know, I think they've done more studies on like the descendants of Holocaust survivors. um, And then certainly there's a a huge interest and awareness around um, the role of trauma more broadly. But um, yeah, even all the like trauma awareness, trauma informed this and that is still uh, in some ways a kind of an emerging area, I would say. It's not <clears throat> it's not totally mainstream yet. Um, so that'll be interesting to to watch. And I do think that 
a lot of these new waves within medicine emerge, you know, kind of on the sidelines and then they kind of gradually enter um, the mainstream. So it'll be interesting to watch what happens. Uh, we're getting a question around uh, something you talked about earlier. Someone's asking, why did people use sign language in 19th century Martha's Vineyard and how did this help the small uh, community uh, cohere? Okay, yeah, um, I, I guess I referred to that parenthetically, and that must have been a little confusing. Um, there's an interesting story, which is that um, the people who first settled on Martha's Vineyard uh, from England, uh, they interbred and didn't leave and even go to Boston, not that far away. They stayed on the island. And um, over several generations, uh, the interbreeding or inbreeding took its toll, and a hereditary uh, condition developed. Uh, hereditary deafness and by the I guess by the end mid eight to the end of the 19th century uh, up to a quarter of the residents had some degree of deafness and on the mainland people were always discouraged from speaking sign language because it was considered to be savage but in on Martha's Vineyard where they were pretty isolated they developed their own sign language and when the first oral historians started to do work on those settlements, they couldn't even get people to say who was deaf and who wasn't because they couldn't remember. They'd say, well, I don't know. We all spoke sign language. So I wasn't sure always who was deaf and who wasn't. And even when the last deaf person who suffered from hereditary deafness had left the island, a lot of people still used sign language just out of habit. And so the point is that if everybody spoke sign language, then nobody was truly disabled. And why is this an important example? It's a really specific example from a long time ago, but it illustrates what scholars now call the social model of disability, which is that you are disabled only when society makes it so. And therefore you can be not disabled if society makes it so as well. And that, is an important lesson for us to learn. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great example. And yeah, for everyone who's watching and listening, um, in addition to picking up Richard's book, um, I think it is very helpful to look up uh, the social model of disability just to understand that, you know, uh, the notion of being disabled is largely um, contextual and the way the environment, you know, impacts access. Um, so that's really important. Um, and for everyone who's watching or listening, um, if you have questions, please share them now. Um, we're getting closer to the end. We're not quite wrapping up yet, but please uh, let us know your questions in the chat if you're if you're watching. Um, so, Richard, one thing I think it's so important to do um, when you know we write these books and there's a lot of research is to uh, translate it as best as we can into really like practical tidbits and takeaways, right? And we've talked about this before, but um, when you imagine, you know, school teachers reading your book or, or parents reading your book and therapists, obviously, um, or just anyone from general society, what do you think are very concrete sort of um, daily changes that, they, that people can make in, in their own lives? One of the things that uh, I learned cross-culturally is that um, a lot of people with medical and mental illnesses have a lot more social supports than we have here. And that you know, resonates with what I was saying about our emphasis on living independently and being autonomous individuals. Um, you know, when I, I said earlier that I was always asked if my daughter would live independently, I asked that question of people in Namibia in the village where the little boy who's nonverbal, non-speaking is, and um, they didn't even understand the question. They meant, they, they said, you mean like if our whole village dies? <laughs> you know, I know it's trite to say it takes a village, right? But it, it does hold true. And so one of the things that I do recommend people do if they live with someone with a disability is make sure that you reaffirm your social supports. Every time I've done research in another country, I come back to the United States and I contact my cousins and my second cousins and all of the people that I'm related to, to just sort of reaffirm those ties. Because if there's one thing that we do know 
it is that above all, above talk therapy, medicines, anything, social supports are the most reliable uh, measure of positive outcomes. People have social supports. So I do that kind of thing, um, which is, I think that's a really practical thing. Make sure you have lots of social supports. Um, I think that another very practical uh, step that people can take is to um, teach their children to be open and to, and that, that talking about one's strengths and challenges is not something that is shameful, but it is something that empowers you. And no matter who you are, whether you score down here on some intelligence test or score up here, we all are going to have various strengths and weaknesses. Um, on some parts of the, um, uh, the WISC, the, the, the famous intelligence test, uh, on the spatial visual reasoning, I look intellectually disabled because I'm so bad at visual spatial reasoning, right? That is a, that is a deficit of mine. But I excel in other areas. And so um, what we need to do is to have people, you know, be, you know, feel open about talking about these things because it is a much more safe environment. And the, the moment in my daughter's middle school, when we taught her the word autism, and she could use that word autism, was also the moment in which she could really appreciate her strengths and not just think only about her deficits. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I love what you're saying about social supports. And I think, of course, the hard thing is that in our highly individualistic Western culture, many of us don't have that, you know, I think. And that's um, a huge issue in the United States um, in um, thinking about parental support, family support. Um, I think, you know, even recent conversations around you know, if you've seen someone struggling um, with mental illness, um, you know, on the street, you know, um, are there options to call a, a, a licensed counselor instead of a, a police person? You know, like I think structurally and, and systemically, we don't have those supports. Um, so I think that's something that we're all going to have to contend with and hopefully we can push for policy change. And then I think you had told me, practically speaking, that actually what happens is that so many people are now going to their primary care physician. Is that right? You were saying that because primary care physicians are kind of like the first line, like the first kind of gate they within. Those are uh, the first line and they prescribe the majority of psychotropic meds are, are prescribed by internal medicine. And do you think, I mean, what do you think about that from like um, a long-term perspective, you know, and just in terms of people getting the care, are primary physicians like a proxy for social support? Or I, mean, I, I think in my pr perspective, primary physicians are also going to get very burned out then because that's not necessarily their, their training. Um, but I know there's some tension there, I think. Yeah, I mean, I just think we, we have to have a, a pretty broad view of what a social support is. I just did a, um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion event for a, 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 a big apparel company. Mm -hmm. And um, they have sponsors. And the sponsors could be people who are uh, lower than you on the hierarchy of the, in the company or higher. But whatever, they are there for you to talk to uh, about what you're going through and to keep it confidential if you want. Um, and so they've built in a social support network into the company itself. Now, you may use that sponsor, you may not, um, but that sponsor is somebody who at least you know in that environment is a safe person to talk to. I think in the military, uh, we need to have that more often because um, so many soldiers suffer from so many um, mental illnesses. And the problem is that if you talk to somebody, they are required to talk to their commander and somebody else and you get everybody involved and it kind of can get out of control. But it is important to recognize mental illnesses are very, you know, it's a very sensitive thing. You know, it's, it's it, a mental illness is not a broken leg. Right. And so, um, 
uh, it is vital that we have places where people can go to talk and, and, and to feel that they have support. And it might be at work, it might be at home, it might be on the internet. We're finding that some people who are on the autism spectrum we're actually finding a lot of emotional supports now on Zoom calls um, and other remote forms of sociality that they didn't have access to before the pandemic. And that for some people, those social supports are being are really incredibly therapeutic. While for other people on the autism spectrum, we're finding that the isolation from the structures of their previous activities, whether it's school or whatever, is resulting in a loss of functional skills that they had worked so hard to develop and they're really have, uh, worsening significantly. So it's not, there's no simple answer to the question. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, I'd love to actually just brainstorm that a little bit further. Um, you know, we could let's reflect on the United States situation, but also perhaps something we've seen in other cultures. I think that's fantastic what you were saying about the company having sponsors. Um, I know when I was doing my research, um, Margot Joff at Yahoo, she started um, the first neurodiversity employees uh, resources group. Um, I know that there's there's this great group called Sidewalk Talk that um, they just like set up chairs on the street and they allow anyone to sit down and just like really talk from the heart about whatever is going on with them and they're entirely volunteer run. Um, I'm trying to think if there are other examples. Are there other things that you've seen that are would kind of represent for you uh, a change in the culture around mental health? Yeah, you know, one of the things that... Um that I think is uh, important again to show the complexity of it is um, I write about this in Nobody's Normal that J.P. Morgan Chase started this autism hiring program, a great pro great program. They hired all these people with autism, different interview um, uh, process. Uh, they found that they got lots and lots of really good workers for a variety of different types of skills, but they kind of forgot to go beyond the hiring process to think of it as ongoing social supports. And so in one of the first groups that they had, um, the workers were looking at breaks in code on a computer. They are very, they, they, these young, they were mostly young men were really good at identifying breaks in code so that all the different sites or links on an internet site are connected. And uh, they were so good at it that they finished their work before any of their non-autistic peers. And then they didn't know how to ask for more work. Nobody had talked to them about what do you do when you've finished your job? And they sat around and they played video games or they looked at their phones or whatever. And they got reported as being sort of apathetic, not working hard. And it was that the hiring is only part of the process, right? Yeah. You have to have this ongoing understanding of how those workers are going to do in the same way that I would suppose you would want for any kind of, of worker. But in this case, they had just, this is one little piece. They hadn't taught them what to do when they finished their work. So it has to be something that is clearly ongoing. I do love the alternative interview process because you could interview somebody and they are awkward and socially challenged and you say, oh, they can't fit into this company and you say goodbye to them and don't realize that they're incredibly skilled at looking at code. But the other thing we have to do is we have to stop also stereotyping uh, certain kinds of people as uh, savants. You know, that is a very rare thing, like the good doctor or, uh, you know, or Bill Gates or Elon Musk. Those are the things we, we look at when we regard, we're looking at autism. Uh, most people, the vast, vast majority of people, including my own daughter, are nowhere like that. They might do well in my job. My daughter does well in a very, in a cleaning job. She does a lot of cleaning around animals and she loves it. Uh, there are people who do work in food and um, uh, food care, food service, or counting cells in a microscope or janitorial work. And we should also rethink the way in which we've morally valued work because there are a lot of people who can find meaningful lives working at a grocery store and they love it, and yet maybe their family sees it as somehow less than. And so we have to rethink how we value work morally as well. 
I remember, I'm sorry to go on so long again, but I remember that my daughter was being looked at for a job at uh, stocking at a big drugstore. And I remember she, she, the manager asked her what her job was in the morning. She said, well, in the morning, I'm a cleaning lady. And the manager admonished her and said, you are not a cleaning lady. You are a retail associate. And it, as an anthropologist, it was interesting because this was, this, this was a uh, cultural transmission moment. Mm -hmm. This is where somebody learns in their culture that a job is more valued than another job. And to devalue one kind of thing. And my daughter had never thought of cleaning as somehow of low value. But now she was being taught that. Wow, that is so interesting. And I think a really great um, note to kind of conclude, um, because I think that, you know, behind this entire conversation, like we talked about in the beginning, you know, so much of this comes down to words and the meaning that we, you know, inscribe into words and then how we use those words in different contexts. And, um, and it, it's so powerful. So I'm so excited about the narrative shift, you know, that, that we're seeing. And I want to thank everyone. Wow. What an incredible program. I'm the chair of health and medicine, uh, Robert Lee Kilpatrick. And I want to thank professor Richard Grinker, whose book, uh, nobody's normal has suddenly become at the top of my reading list because I intend to learn more about the social model of disability. And I'd also like to thank Janara Nuremberg and thank you for all the great work you do to bring this kind of programming to the Commonwealth Club of California. You know, for 118 years, we have provided cutting edge programming about all aspects of what's happening in society. And I think at this time in history, we definitely wanna have places where fair and honest and open discourse and discussion can happen. Uh, so I wanna thank all of our members who've attended today. And I'd like to encourage those of you who are not yet members for a modest $10 a month to join, join me uh, to be a member of the Commonwealth Club of California. You can do so at www.commonwealthclub.org. And one of the takeaways from uh, Professor Grinker's talk today was, he said, make sure you have lots of social supports. Well, guess what? After 15 months of digital programming, the Commonwealth Club is slowly moving back into a hybrid model with digital, but also face-to-face -face programs, which means we can all meet each other, go down the street, have a beer, and get to know each other as friends. So I look forward to that time. Thanks to all of you. I encourage you to read Nobody's Normal. And that's all for today. Thanks and goodbye.